All right, so I'm Jennifer Brandis Hepler, and I wanted to talk about exposition here because, uh, show of hands, how many of you woke up today thinking, oh boy, I want to write a giant block of exposition that players are going to button through and forget almost immediately? <laughs> right, and how many of you have had to spend a work day or two doing exactly that? That's kind of what I thought. So now I'm going to stand here for 25 minutes and lecture you on why you should never have someone stand there for 25 minutes and lecture you. <laughs> so uh, let me start with a little bit of who I am. I've been uh, working in games since the late 90s. I started as a freelancer for a bunch of uh, different tabletop role-playing games like Shadowrun and Paranoia. And then after that, I went out to Hollywood for a few years, and I was on a, a television show uh, called The Agency on CBS. Well, I wasn't on it. I wrote for it. And uh, after that, I was recruited by BioWare, and I spent eight years there as a senior writer on all three Dragon Age titles and Star Wars The Old Republic. And when I left BioWare, I spent two years as the lead writer uh, on Game of Thrones Ascent for Disruptor Beam, and I'm also uh, a co-author of The Game Narrative Toolbox, which is a game writing textbook from Focal Press, and I just got the all clear to announce my new book from Focal Press, uh, which is Women in Game Development, Breaking the Glass Level Cap, which will be out this fall. <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, just this January, I made a very big change in my career and took a sort of sideways step into serious games, which is something I've been interested in for a long time. So I'm now working for a company called Cognito Interactive, which uses game-style interactive dialogues to teach doctors and teachers and parents how to have better and more empathetic communication skills with their patients and students and children. So basically, I finally found a way to make money off of all the time that I spend talking to my kids about their feelings and being mad at my doctors. <laughs> So um, to me, exposition is information that you want to get across to players and you want them to remember, and you ha it has to be delivered in dialogue. So let's start by talking about why we actually have dialogue in games. If you saw my talk here two years ago, you've heard me say this before. The purpose of game dialogue is to move the player forward. So why does so much game dialogue end up like this? Let me tell you about my people. Our histories begin in the age of stone and end up with the player kind of like that. Well, a lot of times it's because the dialogue starts out like this, and then after a marketing meeting, it turns into something like that. And then when the lead designer needs to show off the deep, explorable world, you have to add this. And then when QA realizes a week before cert that the whole area is empty and the level designers need to throw in some mobs, you also have to work this in. So uh, does that mean we should get rid of exposition entirely? Are all the execs actually right when they keep asking us to cut, cut, cut? Can we just forget what we're saying and charge into gameplay? Uh, no. Exposition is necessary. It's how players know what's happening, where to go, and what to do next. It's an important tool. It just has to be used correctly. So how do we do it better? Um, one of the key tasks that we have as game writers and narrative designers is to ask the question of when we need to use exposition in dialogue and figure out the difference between when we must use exposition in dialogue, such as when there's plot-critical information that the player needs to complete a quest or mission, when we probably should use exposition in dialogue, such as when the player needs an in-character motivation to carry out a mission, when we can use exposition in dialogue, such as when there's ex information that the player can optionally ask for or that can be delivered without affecting the flow of gameplay, and when we really shouldn't put our exposition in dialogue, which is when there's information that stops your gameplay that isn't relevant to the current mission and the player didn't actually ask for. But I see some of you writhing in your seats. I have all this lore. I've been working on this world Bible, and it's like 5,000 pages long, and it's got the full history, and what am I supposed to do with it? Well, world lore is great for a lot of things that is, are not dialogue. World lore is fantastic for using in in-game books and journals. 
Um, it's great for ambient dialogue that the player can overhear and not have to interact with. If you're in a game oops, that has um, optional question hubs, world lore is great for filling those out. World lore is uh, very important when you're doing a game that uses environmental storytelling, using visuals and audio that the player doesn't directly interact with. Uh, world lore is essential uh, when you're doing an uh, auxiliary product like a novel or a webcomic. And uh, if you're in a game that has a lot of world lore and your players are into that sort of thing, it can even be worthwhile to do a codex where they can look it up. So if we're not going to be talking about exposition about world lore, what are we generally talking about here? Usually we're talking about plot. And a lot of times game plots, especially if you're on something like a big RPG like I've been on, you get these labyrinthine things that are sort of like this, crossed with some of that, and maybe a little of this thrown in for good measure. So how do you get all of that across to players in a way where they're going to have any idea what's going on? Um, you need to figure out what your key pieces of information are and present them in bite-sized pieces. For example, let's take a plot where we find out that there's an ancient crown that's gone missing, and we learn that the crown is imbued with elven magic, and we find out that the elven kingdom used to lie to the west, and that the kingdom was destroyed in the war with the goblins. In most games, each of these points should probably be its own dialogue. Uh, you can assume that players will only really remember one thing, usually the last thing, in any dialogue. So by splitting up your important information into different conversations, you really increase the chances that players are going to remember anything. And, uh, of course, when we split up our uh, information into little crumbs and we tr trickle it along for players to follow, we call that a breadcrumb trail. So are there any best practices for breadcrumb trails? What I've found is that it's really important for players to know what they're looking for first and only then get the details of why and how to use it. So to go back to our crown example, um, you could do something in a game where maybe you would start with a scrap of ancient prophecy that says that only the magic of the elven crown can defeat the goblin king, and you know from the map that there are elven ruins in the west. So you go there, and you find the runes that tell the story of the first battle between the elves and goblins, but you can't translate the runes yet. Then on the way out, you meet a scholar who can translate the runes, and he tells you where the escape route was that the elven royalty escaped down when the uh, kingdom fell. And only once you follow the escape route do you actually find the crown and the information of how to use it. By presenting the information in this order, what, why, where, and how, you make sure that players have a goal in mind, that is the what, that is motivating them to listen when you tell them all that backstory, which is the why. Um, and then you present the piece of information that is going to let them go to the next plot point. That's the where. Uh, and only then do you tell them how this one quest is going to fit into the larger storyline. That's the how. So what this all sort of boils down to is that exposition should be the solution to a problem that players are trying to solve already. If players are already trying to solve something and you give them exposition that helps them, they're going to want to listen to it and try to remember it. So what pitfalls can we run into when we're trying to use breadcrumb trails? Um, the first one that I've seen happen a lot is what I call the maybe the elves know something problem. <laughs> And we did this a lot on Dragon Age Inquisition, where we had, you know, a big document that we were working from, and it said, and then the player figures out that maybe the elves know something. And our writers would go off into a room, and they would dutifully write, you know, your followers saying, maybe the elves know something. And then we would all play test it, and we would, you know, follow the followers who were saying, maybe the elves know something. And we would end up basically wandering around, waiting for the next plot-delivering NPC to find us. And it all felt a little like this. And uh, we found that you could actually correct this really, really easily by just giving the player something that they were looking for. Go to the Elven Ruins and get the widget of what's itness. And then you could keep all of the rest of, of what you already had of the, the next plot delivering NPC finding you. And instead of feeling like the designers were, you know, manipulating you, it felt like, hey, this is my reward for my hard, hard work of looking for the widget of what's itness. 
Um, so that was a really easy fix for what had seemed to be a really intractable problem. Um, the next big pitfall that you see, especially with beginning writers, is the let me tell you a story mentality where people figure that the player's going to want to know everything about this crown before they go looking for it. And the problem with doing that is if the player doesn't know why that information is relevant to them, they literally don't know which mental filing cabinet to file it under, and so instead it just gets left on the floor and they don't remember anything about it. Um, by following the, um, the, the what, why, where, how uh, order that I had in the previous slide, you can avoid that problem because uh, by the time players get the story, they know exactly what it's relevant to, and therefore it's a lot more likely that they're going to remember it. And the last uh, pitfall that I've found is red herrings. Uh, I discovered a long time ago as a tabletop GM, do not put red herrings in your games unless you want players to swim after them off a cliff. Um, as a general rule, if players go to the trouble of remembering a piece of exposition that you tell them in a game, they expect it to be important, and if it turns out it's not important, they don't go, oh, darn, I was an idiot for following that red herring. They go, your game is broken, and it sucks. Um, so unless you're willing to deal with that consequence, there's usually not any compelling reason to include red herrings in interactive games. So let's go back to the beginning, the most basic piece of advice that you get in every English class and screenwriting seminar and writing book on the market of show, don't tell. What does that mean for games, especially games where all the information is being delivered in dialogue? Isn't everything being told? Well, I like to think of exposition as the bitter pill you're trying to get players to swallow, while characterization is the delicious chocolate coating that makes it go down easy. So most of the rest of this talk is going to focus on characterization, because if you make sure that the characters who deliver your exposition are interesting in and of themselves, then you can make that exposition go from this to this. So the best exposition is characterization. When somebody is telling you something about a plot in your game, you want to know not just what happened, but how it affected them. So if we consider the news in a Star Wars game that the Empire has landed on a Republic outpost, if we get told this by a Republic commander, this information will probably come across briefing style. Maybe she'll give you some of the political or martial significance of the outpost. Maybe she'll be concerned about looking good to her superior. But if it's told by the outpost's terrified janitor who's hiding in a closet, then you might get the human cost. Maybe he has a family and the Republic won't let them evacuate the planet and surrender to the Empire. Um, if you tell it from the point of view of a defecting Imperial, uh, you'll get a whole third point of view on that. You'll get something about how much better the quality of life is on the outpost and how you have to drive off the Empire or she'll be executed. You get the same information that the Empire has landed on the planet, but it's three very different dialogues. And if all three of these characters are in one story, you can end up with a more complex picture of what's happening. But because they're such different perspectives, it's not a giant exposition bomb. So when you're writing exposition delivering NPCs, uh, there are two major things that you need to keep in mind. Their speaking style and their stake in the story. So let's break these down a little bit. Um, for speaking style, you want to determine all of the basic things like sentence length and vocabulary and slang usage. It's the difference between, oi, me hut is a fire, my lord, can you help me? And brave adventurer, this land is seeing troubles, the likes of which we have rarely seen. And now you know why I'm not a voice actor. Um, so... Um, both of these can equally introduce a quest about, in a fantasy game about saving a village from bandits, but they are very different experiences of what mindset you're in when you start that quest. But even more importantly than the speaking style is what extraneous information do they wrap the important information in? If there isn't any extraneous information, if they're literally not telling you anything other than that bandits are attacking this village, then they can be replaced with a sign nailed to a tree that says, bandits this way. 
And if your character can be replaced with a sign nailed to a tree, you've done something wrong. So you want to be considering what else they're saying about the situation at the same time as they're giving you the plot critical information. It's the difference between that guy who is talking about justice and how it's not fair that the lords are safe and his people are the ones who are left to starve and die, and the other guy who's mostly just concerned about whether it's going to look bad to the neighbors if he lets his people get killed by bandits. Um, so just to delve into the, uh, the more academic for a second here, um, generally the more information that you can convey through subtext, the less expository your writing is going to feel. Subtext is the art of not saying exactly what you mean. It's the difference between this and this. And uh, um, any information that's part of the background of a world or plot or character or has to do with how a character is feeling should generally go in subtext. Only information that the player has to immediately act on should be in broad, simple text. And if you're doing serious games work where you actually need to teach your players something, um, and you can't trust them to, to get what you put in the subtext, you can consider using analogies to make information memorable. Uh, I use this a lot in my work at Cognito. Uh, we did a sim to help teach parents how to help their children manage their feelings. And instead of just saying, teach children words for their feelings, we would say things like, just like you tell your baby, that's your nose, a hundred times before they say nose, you need to tell them that's your angry and that's your scared. And by using that kind of analogy, it makes the information much more memorable. So stake in the story. If the person who is telling you the information has no stake in the story, then they're probably the wrong person to be giving you this information. You need to replace them with somebody who has something more to lose from what they're saying. Everybody who's talking to you in a game story should have something they want, need, fear, stand to gain or stand to lose from what they're saying. And it's the variety of these stakes that gives your story texture. If you use too many of the same stake in the story in a row, it gets old, even if it's something legitimately interesting like needing the player to save their life. Um, you want to have a great variety of stakes in the plot. Some people should be doing stuff for noble reasons, some for selfish reasons, some might be deceiving the player, some are offering to profit the player, and others might be asking them to be altruistic. Um, and emotion. If characterization is the chocolate coating that we're using to make our exposition taste good, Emotion is actually the sugar that lets us taste all the rest of the work we've put in, because without that, the chocolate tastes kind of like this. Um, so even if you've done the rest right and you have an interesting character with a stake in the story and a cool speaking style, if they don't feel anything about what they're saying, then neither will the player. And a lot of times writers get afraid of sentiment. They don't want to be maudlin or melodramatic. And my personal philosophy on this has always been... What the hell? I want my characters to have really big feelings and really care about what they're saying. If it comes across as melodramatic, it's usually easier to tone down a line or performance than it is to add emotion to something written blandly. So all of this generally means that when you're writing for games, you want to be writing twice. The first time you go through and you figure out the information flow of what does the player need to know to be able to get through this game. This is the basics of the job, and if you haven't done this right, then the game doesn't work. But then to do the job really well, you want to go through a second time and figure out in every dialogue, why does the NPC think she's there? What is this story from her point of view? Um, and it can't just be that she's there because she wants to tell you about this. She should have a legitimate reason to be there of her own accord. So... One thing to keep in mind when you're doing this second pass is that most people are really self-centered. They don't tend to care about the fate of the world unless it's their job. So your plots become more interesting the more you're dealing with people who, this is not their job. Uh, so this is why the poor janitor's story is a lot more memorable than the Republic commander's. The more personal an NPC's motivations, the more memorable they generally are. 
But one thing to keep in mind is that characterization can also really be exposition if all that your characterization is is characters telling you about their background. So if you look back to the show don't tell maxim, it can help to realize that exposition is any kind of telling, even if you're telling people about character, while characterization is any kind of showing, even if it's about world or plot. So just telling players the facts of a character's backstory of, hi, I'm Bob, I'm a Jedi Knight, I entered the academy at four, and I apprenticed to Master So-and-so and fought my first battle at blah, 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 none of that is really characterization, even though a lot of writers would think it is. Characterization comes from how characters react, not from long explanations. If you have a character with a complex backstory, you can handle that just like any other exposition. It can be broken into parts and then delivered by other characters who have their own reason to like or hate the character in question. For example, let's go back to Star Wars and say we have a character who was once tortured by the Empire. Um, in order to show this to the player, you could do something like first show him being very anti-Empire, even when talking to somebody really sympathetic, like a defector who just saved your life. Then later, maybe he knows something that he shouldn't, like the back way into an Imperial ship. Then once you're inside the Imperial ship, you meet somebody who recognizes him. But because you're in the middle of a firefight, you can't stop and ask about it right now. Uh, this means that by the time you can really ask about the backstory, a lot of the basics of it have been established already. Um, you've already been intrigued about it for a while so that when the backstory information is given to you, it feels like the answer to a question you've already been asking. And you've already seen that it can be useful to you. Look, he knew this one thing about the Imperial ship. What else might he know if I get him to answer uh, the full story of what happened to him? Um, and uh, the last thing I want to talk about is stereotypes. When you are designing a character to give exposition and you're thinking about their speaking style and their stake in the story and what their emotion is and everything I just said, don't necessarily go with the first thing that comes to mind uh, because sometimes that's this or this guy or her or this guy and nobody really wants to see any of them. So it's always good to try picking a character and a speaking style or motivation that don't match what your first impression of what that character would be like. And then you can figure out how they got that way. So our story earlier would have been even more interesting if the Republic commander was at the outpost because her family was there, and she was willing to defy orders to help you save them, while the janitor was actually a retired officer or weekend warrior who wanted to die in the blaze of glory that you've set off. And when you're writing people of different backgrounds than yourself, um, don't be scared to get it wrong. It's important to do your research, but if you write humans, that's more than half the battle. Any character who is a credible human being is going to be better than the majority of characters um, who are out there in people's own fan fiction and in an unfortunate amount of published material. So if, uh, if your characters have convincing human emotions, it goes a long way to battling any stereotypes. So in conclusion, my background is in RPGs, so some of what I said may apply better there than to other genres. But for all games, exposition is best delivered in small pieces. Exposition should be the solution to problems that players are already trying to solve. And most of all, you should think about who is delivering your exposition and what they want to get out of saying it. Pick the person who has the most interesting reason to be there and get into their head. And if that all goes well, maybe someday some of you will get to write what we all know is the number one absolute best way to ever deliver exposition, a musical number. <laughs> so thank you. I'm Jennifer Hepler.